Ladies and gentlemen, great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Mr. Professor Mislivet. Okay, I have 20 minutes, so I can only give so some bullet points, as it were, some, some statements, uh, details you can leave for discussion and for subsequent elaboration. Okay, uh, I am addressing the issue whether we are a, a viable species a viable culture. Uh, we need, we know that the term unsustainability means that you cannot continue the way you are. You need to change. And this question is, how do we change? So it's no longer a question, I think, whether we, whether we have to change. That's very clear. There is a process. We are now in a situation of crisis and it leads to what in the system sciences we talk about a bifurcation. It means that the evolutionary trajectory that we have followed in recent years is changing. It's giving rise to something else because the status quo is not an option. The change driver is the catastrophic unsustainability, in other words, uh, and, uh, the lack of sustainability to the point where it leads to catastrophe. Now, the per perceived driver is in this, uh, the uh, climate change and, uh, and global migration. One is a nature, the other one is a human society. But the situation with nature is that we know, and we could go into give all the data that you like, um, that uh, we are destroying the balances, uh, leading to extinction, large, large numbers of species, and we are basically uh, destroying the integrity of the natural systems, which are the basis of life. Uh, the, on the human level, we are taking apart the integrity of societies. On the political level, we are polarizing societies. Very clear-cut case, for example, is, is now in the United States. Total division, total cut across the integrity. You are this way or you are that way, but uh, the, the parties are opposed and in conflict. And similar situations, less, less, less striker, striking occur elsewhere too in the world. We are destroying that particular integrity which is required for a viable system to maintain itself. Uh, this means that uh, the whole policy on, in, in, on the level of politics of putting oneself first and never mind the rest in business of winning and outcompeting, all of these are all destroying that kind of ne necessary balance that you require, that coherence that you require to maintain a system in a viable condition. So these are uh, drivers, which means that you're pushing us beyond the status quo. The responses could be various. Uh, two alternative responses are we'll try to continue going on the way we have and it will reach to increasing intolerance, increasing opposition that we see in, polit in politics already and uh, an increasing level of fear and producing frustration. And this is if we, if we continue the way we are but that means the situation is unsustainable. It will just create more and more levels of unsustainability. The alternative is, seems to be utopian, but really what I want to devote this short, short, very short talk to is really to say that the alternative is realistic, even though it doesn't seem so. There is a possibility of moving to another way of conceiving our situation, other way of surviving, other way of acting. And that I just highlight this other way 
by this kind of spiritual terms, but concentrated, centered on healing, using the feeling, the empathy and sympathy, and the whole idea of consciousness. What are we, how is our consciousness? Most more and more people are saying today that what we need is a, is a fundamental change, and this fundamental change means an alternation, an evolution of consciousness, or at any rate, a change of consciousness. So this, these are two, two scenarios for moving forward. And the, the very visible scenario is A, from intolerance to frustration, and it's resulting on, on, on breakdown, probably. So these are some elements of the sustainable situation today, but you know them all. Uh, the biological, uh, natural sustainability, social sustainability, all those. And so I, I, will, I won't spend these few minutes that I have available on this. But I just put it up here, just so that you can see it. Uh, we are in a situation where the change, necessity for change is becoming more and more evident. But I want to go on to basically what I consider is the more important element here, which is, this is this, where do we go from here? Can we change? Can we change in a positive way? Or will we only change when the unsustainability becomes catastrophic? It brings catastrophic conditions. I am proposing to you a hypothesis, which I've investigated now also with my colleagues, with my collaborators, that we can indeed find a better way. That this better way is already there, is already appearing, but it's not very visible and it's not powerful, not yet. But to the extent that the mainstream way doing things as we always have becomes less and less possible, less and less uh, productive, less and less viable, to that extent the alternative ways are being promoted into realism, from utopian to realism, because there is really no other good way. Now, of course, it's possible that we don't change, we don't wake up, as it were, and then we'll have reached major catastrophes, major fallbacks of the population, major, major climate problems, major energy problems. It's entirely possible. I'm not saying that this is the probable future that we change, but I think it's a possible future. There are indications on the, on the edges, on the margins of society, that they could move to the mainstream that there is, there is an awakening, there is a, an increasing valuation of collaboration, of coming together instead of competition, or in place of competition, <clears throat> that there is a, a, a shift toward empathy, toward moving in the same direction, and all this is very strongly supported by new technologies technologies of, uh, of sharing, technologies of information, uh, collaboration based on information. And it, it is this, these new developments are occurring in many spheres. The, the conservative elements are always stopping, are always hindering the, the advance of these developments. For example, in education, we know that we could use the new technology to create, to eliminate the classical classroom. I'm just using it as an example. And we could, we could bring in people from all parts of the world. We could create collaborative uh, teams, collaborative research programs on, on which we can draw on the new technologies of information and, co and communication to create groups who will discuss what we are doing, where we are, and possibly change. It's possible. The conservative elements here are, of course, the classical structures of the universities, the, the elite universities, the academies, and so on, which want to keep on doing things the way they have been doing and keep control. They're in business, for example. The, the classical way is, is a hierarchical way as well. The main uh, center 
governments, governance stru structures, the, uh, the, the presidents and their vice presidents and the uh, heads of the various divisions are maintaining the system to operate in a way which they consider is the good way, which means serving the interests of the shareholders and being out to win, to outcompete in the marketplace, creating larger market share for themselves. In politics, the mainstream, of course, is, is, is being gathering as much power and influence in the world as possible for the nation and uh, for the government for the government of the given nation and within the government of course the key individuals who are running the, the government all of these uh, are, are conservative elements and if they remain powerful the situation will become untenable break down the alternative to this is the from the margins from the periphery whether there are movements powerful enough to move toward the center so that they can take over. For example, that we can recognize that in business, which is already a trend there, uh, that we, we, the purpose is not the maximum gathering of, of uh, profit and, uh, and, uh, and uh, financial power equity for themselves, for ourselves but to create a positive contribution to society, serving the stakeholder rather than just the shareholder. And the stakeholder in business, particularly big businesses, of course, is, is society in a very large, broad segment of it. These new trends in business are very much involved with following some of them. I just come home last week from China, where we had a major meeting also with these kind of ideas uh, in, in the forefront. Uh, this is a, 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 a powerful movement that is beginning to show, to show among business leaders. Politics is very obvious. Are we just out to win the power for the, for, and, and use military might if necessary, and police forces, and use violence to gain power and maintain power for ourselves? Or are, are we moving toward a direction which is, means sharing power which means trying to create a community which can survive. We can, we can go on and on. Uh, I have actually uh, collected a little a set of these positive developments, and they are all based on sharing, all based on participation, or all are based on empathy between people, and they are all empowered, or made possible at any rate, by the new technologies of communication where we can all join together and the voice of our people can be heard. And I, I, my time, I know, is very, very limited here, so I'll just give you one more thought, a food for thought. And that is, is there a something in the system of human society and human mind which favors the alternative approach? As a systems theorist and systems philosopher, I think that it is. It appears now, and let me just make this short excursion, it appears now that the complexity of the natural world, I'm not talking about boxes and star stellar systems, although we can use that too, but the complexity of the biological world is such that random processes could not have given rise to the systems that we find today in the world, with which we live, and including our own body and organism and our own social ecological systems. Red chance interactions could not have produced the complexity and the coherence that we find in the world, not within the, evo within the evolutionary time frame, 50 million years or whatever we consider it for biological evolution, 13.8 billion years for, for physical evolution in the universe, in all this, if you count it out, uh, it is not sufficient to produce the complexity and the coherence that we find in the world. So therefore, there is something in nature, there is something in the, in the universe which favors the creation of coherent entities as opposed to chaos and disintegration. We would have long disintegrated 
or Inter, we would not have even have taken off from the chaos of the original Big Bang if it wasn't there. There is something which, which I call a holotropism, a tropism and an attraction toward wholeness. Max Planck said in this one of his last lectures in Florence that he considers the fact that the, these vibrations, these frequencies that, that uh, con constitute the quantum particles, such as the proton and the neutron, and make them form and form associations, such as the uh, such as the nucleus of the atom, and such as the bringing in electrons according to the Pauli exclusion principles. These are all laws and regularities which create structure. Paul, Max Planck said that he considers these to be an indication of a higher mind, of a higher intelligence in the universe. Whatever that may be, and Einstein was very favorable to this. He's also talked about the laws of nature as indication a mind far vast, much vaster, by far greater than the power of the human mind. Of course, there was Jung and, and a whole series of, of, of major uh, scientific figures who are all speculating on whether there is something underlying the evolution of the universe other than pure chance. It seems that chance is not an answer. Randomness could not have produced what we have. Therefore, there is something which I call a holotropic attractor. I don't have time now to develop this idea, but just to say that the minimal presupposition is that there is a tendency built into the laws of nature which favors uh, intelligent cooperation, uh, which, which favors integration and creating systemic units opposed to chaos and disintegration and conflict. This particular holotropism is likely to be in us as well. In my new book, which is, has not been finished yet, but it should be published next fall, I look at what I call uh, spontaneous transformative experiences. So when people are really find a spontaneous experience, and it's not rationally, uh, rationally figured out, it just comes. And these spontaneous transformative experiences more and more are occurring now. And they all end up somehow by sh being based on an element which is cause, which calls for collaboration, which calls for union. The terms oneness, wholeness, among young people, the term love, these are all occurring more and more frequently. They all indicate basically one thing there is an inborn tendency toward creating integration, integrity, coherence, and complexity in the world. Evolution builds in that direction, non-linearly, non of course, but it, it, on the whole, it's moving in that direction. Now, currently, it seems that these trends may be breaking down due to the stupidity, due to the short-sightedness of the leading uh, uh, leading powers and uh, misuses of technology for individual power and interest. But there is perhaps something surfacing among the, in the heart, in the mind, in the spirit of people at, in the periphery, which is tending in the opposite directions, tending in the direction of pulling together of empathy. And it's not accidental that young people respond to this more and more, that there's such a new culture growing up. Let me end just by saying this much. We are facing a bifurcation. We're facing a situation in which change has become necessi necessary, and whether we change this co by continuing the status quo, changing by the keeping to the same principles that we have uh, kept to in the last couple of centuries or not, is, um, is still open. It may or may not be the case. If we don't change positively, we face a very serious breakdown. We face even possibly the extinction of higher forms of life, including human life. But we have a unique, uh, unique resource. We are conscious. We can discuss these problems. We can become aware of the problems and of the opportunities, and therefore, we can't use alternative means for moving forward. 
these alternative means are given, the technologies are there, communication is possible, our intelligence is capable of perceiving the problems, we can pull together if we are become aware of them. And if, as is known these days, if we wake up in time, remains to be seen. But signs that we can discuss these issues are very positive. Signs that more and more people are, are questioning whether we can go on the way we have and looking for alternatives. And that more and more people are looking inside to themselves, into themselves, to find the answers. My conclusion is the, the solution will come, not come from above or from the outside. If it comes, it comes from the inside and from below. It comes from the periphery moving toward the mainstream. It comes from people looking into themselves, finding that there is a major element in their psyche, in their intellect, which says cooperate, empathy, even love, rather than just dominate and put yourself in a position of first and never mind the rest. We live in exciting times, but we should not disregard the fact that we are social beings, as Aristotle already said, that we have something which is holotropic in us, as it is in the universe as well, and that we have a chance to survive on this planet. It's not assured, it's not guaranteed, but there is a chance. Nature is holotropic. We are basically holotropic. Can we recover this instance? Can we recover this, this insight? That is the big question. Thank you for that.